What do you know about the function of blood? It's um, used to carry oxygen around the body. Okay, so it's been used, it's used to carry oxygen around the body. Why do you think, when we look at the blood vessels in this diagram, why are some of the vessels red and others blue? Because some of the blood's oxygenated and some isn't. Okay, that's right. So that when the blood's um, got oxygen, then it gets this um, brilliant red colour, um, and when there's no oxygen, then the blood takes a um, takes a more blue, more um, or sometimes in the tube it looks more like a purple colour. So why would then would we say is blood from a cut bright red? We could say it's oxygenated, but where is this blood coming from? Capillaries. Okay, so from capillaries or maybe from the smallest arteries, depends on how big the um, big the cut is. So the blood that's coming out here um, is still oxygenated and so it's looking nice and bright red. With this blood sample that's been taken from a person, where is the blood normally taken from? Vein in the arm. So vein in the arm, and so um, why, why then would you expect the blood would typically be a purple type colour? Because it's blood that's going back to the heart, so it's low in oxygen. That's right, yeah. So the oxygen has been removed from the blood as the blood passes through the capillaries in the tissues, and then the blood that's returning into the heart is much lower in oxygen than the blood that's coming from the heart. Which, which do you think, of, out of arteries and veins, would have the thicker walls? The arteries, because the they have to control the higher pressure in the blood. Um, and so for taking blood, it's more convenient to use a vein which has a um, thinner, thinner wall. What do we use to actually increase the pressure inside the vein when we take a blood sample? You use this strap to constrict the blood vessels. That's right, yeah. So a tourniquet or a strap is put on the upper part of the arm. So that's kind of um, up at the, the top level of the arm. And then that causes an increase in the pressure in the veins um, below the point of the tourniquet. Um, and that makes it easier to get the needle into the vein and helps the, the blood to flow more easily. I mentioned that there are cells and plasma in the blood. Here's just a picture of a centrifuge. This is sitting on a desktop. It needs a power supply to run it. Uh, you can see things in the middle of the centrifuge. There are some green and yellow um, um, holders. We actually call them buckets, although they're smaller than a normal household bucket. We put tubes of blood into these um, into the centrifuges. The centrifuge then works for five or ten minutes. We spin at maybe a thousand times per minute, and that achieves a separation of cells and plasma. So this is a, um, the left hand side of the diagram shows a figure, the right hand side is an actual tube. Uh, so the red cells comprise usually a bit less than half the total volume of the blood and they get packed down at the bottom of the tube in this picture. Uh, now the plasma comprises a little more than half the total volume and you can see that as a um, yellow, or actually in this tube, it's sort of even kind of tinged a little bit of red, um, which is probably caused by some broken red cells in the process of preparing this um, sample. And then just in, you can see a hazy kind of whitish um, area sitting on top of the red cells. So the red cells are a, um, uh, the major component, but the, the, that white film on top of the red cells is the white cells. And so that's the typical result of a centrifugation of a, um, of a blood sample. And so let's um, sort of just go through some of the components of the blood then. So this picture is taken with a microscope. Uh, after a thin film of blood is prepared on a microscope slide. Um, it's then been stained with some dyes to help us see the cells. So there are lots of small round cells in this picture. Um, what do you think they are? Red blood cells. So they're the red blood cells. They're the most numerous cells in the blood. 
Um, these are um, they're small. Uh, they're they're pretty round. Their diameter. Anybody got any idea of a guess of a diameter of a cell? Uh, now we're hearing micrometers. That's in the right zone. And I think did I hear seven to seven or eight? Is that that's the uh, size of red cells? So we're dealing way below the capacity of our eyes to see a cell. Now, the, this slide also shows two larger cells. Uh, they've actually been stained with special dye so that we can see them. But what are these two? What do you think these two larger cells might be? White blood cells. Yeah, so these are white blood cells. And uh, so when we look at the um, actual blood tube, they have a natural colour of being white. Um, but when we stain the cells so that we can see them easily under the microscope, then the dye gives them much darker colours. We are, so what, what, what is this and what's the idea of the shape of this cell? So this is a, um, this is, so this is a red cell done with a very high um, uh, magnification with an um, instrument called an electron microscope. Now the shape, um, it's sometimes considered as a bit like a donut, except that the middle hasn't been punched out. So if you think of a um, you know Krispy Kreme kind of donut, except with a thin rim of pastry um, filling up the um, filling up the circle, well that's kind of the shape of this um, of this cell, and so this is uh, this is a very kind of efficient surface, so that the oxygen can quickly diffuse out of the cell. Um, so it creates quite a large amount of surface area in relation to the volume of the cell. What's different about these red cells compared with the previous picture? So what, what do you think about the amount of colour in these, um, these red cells? There's not as much dying in the centre. Yeah, there's not as much extent of colour into the centre. It's more a sort of thin rim of, um, of colour, more um, around the edge. And so this is from a patient with a form of anemia. Do you know what, what's a, an important um, sort of um, dietary component, an important nutrient that we need to have to make haemoglobin? Iron. Yeah, we need iron. And this slide comes from somebody <laughs> with iron deficiency, so they're not making enough haemoglobin because haemoglobin is a combination of iron and a protein. If there's not enough iron, uh, then the cells are produced which are um, lacking in um, colour when we look at them and they're also actually a little bit smaller than the red cells in the healthy person. Donations are usually separated into um, plasma and red cells. Do you know how much donation is normally done? Like 500 mils? 500 mils is the standard amount. Um, and each of these bags here um, contains 500 mils. Um, do you know how much blood we have? How much a, a, a healthy, per how much blood a healthy person has? Any any guesses? Five liters. Five liters. Yeah. So what? So therefore, what percentage are we taking in the um, in the um, blood donation? So we normally take 10 percent, and. Um, how do people generally feel after a blood donation of giving 10%? Pretty pale. Possibly a bit pale, possibly a bit lightheaded. Um, anybody who's um, been through this, did they? Did you get anything to eat or drink after the donation? Yeah. Yeah, lots of juice, sugar. Um, okay, so a bit of sugar kind of combats the lightheadedness and uh, um, a quick amount of fluid um, will help to correct the loss of, um, loss of blood volume. Okay, so this is just a picture of um, blood bags um, in, the, um, in, our, um, in our fridge. And do you know what the A and the O mean? Blood types. So they're blood types and A and O are the two commonest blood types. And why do we like to store the cells in the fridge? Maybe it's a bit of an obvious question. Longer, longer shelf life. Yeah, longer shelf life. Very well phrased. Congratulations. Yeah. 
you know what the little blobs, we haven't mentioned this, this word, but there are little cellular, tiny cells, we call them cells, they're little blobs between the red cells here. This is actually a photo of a person with um, an increased number of these so that they're easier to see. But you, anybody know what these are? Platelets? Yeah, they're platelets. What's the role of platelets? Clotting. Clotting, and so they co collaborate with the clotting factors um, in plugging up those um, holes. And Now some people actually have low platelets and they need to have donations of platelets. And there's a bag of um, bag of platelets. Why do you think somebody might be given a donation of platelets? Hemophilia. Uh, uh, hemophilia, that's a good point. Hemophilia is actually a disease that affects the clotting factors. That's the proteins in the plasma, uh, where we see the, um, the plasma here. So these are clotting factors proteins in the plasma. Um, but actually there are a variety of diseases that we need um, donations for, um, both of pla uh, platelets and, and of red cells. Any comments, any ideas about the sort of serious diseases that people might have where they need donations of red cells? Cancer. Cancer is a, a major use of um, blood these days. This boy um, is getting an infusion of antibodies under the skin. The antibodies have been purified from plasma from donations from healthy people such as yourselves. Um, now, why do you think um, the boy is getting a donation of antibodies and what do we mean by antibodies? Um, he's low on white blood cells. So, uh, so antibodies work together with the white blood cells but antibodies are proteins in the, um, in the plasma fraction of the blood. Uh, so the antibodies work together with white blood cells to help to um, eliminate infections. So this boy's got what we call an um, immune deficiency disease where his um, blood cell, his, his blood system is unable to produce enough antibodies. That means that he's increased risk of getting infections, but by using the antibodies donated by blood donors, they do quite a good job in um, making up for the fact that the boy can't make his own antibodies.